There are a few select games that are transcendent. Mark Messier gets it! I feel great, Vinny, and I know it. Bigger than the sports world. Can you believe it, Miracle? Yes! They are a part of history. He did it! He did it! One such game took place on March 26, 1979, when Magic Johnson and the Michigan State Spartans went head-to-head -head with Larry Bird and the Indiana State Sycamores for the national championship. This is the story of that game. Hi, and welcome to the story of the game. I'm Bob Lee. Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, their names have become intertwined over the past 20 years, to the point it's often hard to mention one without recalling the other. Their first meeting was March 26, 1979, and as in their subsequent meetings, the stakes could not have been higher. In the next two hours, we will relive the Birdman and Magic going head-to-head -head in their epic NCAA championship game that was in Salt Lake City. And we'll also examine how that game and the rivalry that flourished between the two enliven the NBA and change the face of basketball forever. Magic's Michigan State Spartans were expected to make the 1979 Final Four. The year before, the Spartans had lost in the regional finals to the team that won it all in 78, the Kentucky Wildcats. So, 79 dawned with high expectations, and Michigan State delivered. Irvin Johnson, he was a 6-foot, 9-inch point guard, and he and All-American forward Greg Kelser led Judd Heath's coach team to a second straight Big Ten championship. They entered the final in Salt Lake City, having won 14 of their last 15 games, in the NCAA tournament, their margin of victory was an eye-popping 23 points. So Michigan State was expected to be here. Indiana State, here was Cinderella crashing the ball. They rampaged through the Missouri Valley Conference, 29-0 in the regular season. But the conventional wisdom was that this little tiny school would meet reality head-on in the NCAAs. But dancing at the edge of elimination, the Sycamores survived a series of last-second finishes to make it to the Final Four. Larry Bird proved why he was the unanimous college player of the year. His numbers were part of it, 29 points and 15 boards. But more than the numbers, it was his court vision, his passing, his ability to make his teammates better and make his team a winner. Bird powered his team past DePaul in the semifinal, 35 points, 16 boards, 9 assists, just one pass away from a Final Four triple-double. The Sycamores won by two. And so the final was set, Indiana State against Michigan State. Magic Johnson against Larry Bird, the championship game that America had dreamed of. Tonight's center stage belongs to the game's two most dazzling stars. It's the end of the line, showdown time for a whole season of effort. It's Johnson's magical hand at the controls of a high-powered offense against Larry Bird and in an Indiana State dream that has been perfect through 33 games. I've been to many Final Fours, but I have never been to, nor do I ever expect to, go to another one that will have the amazing buzz that the 1979 Final Four had. Everybody wanted it to happen, everybody was waiting for it to happen, and seldom does something like that actually happen. And then when it ultimately became a reality that the two of them would hook up against each other in the final game for a national championship, it was like a heavyweight championship fight. It was like an Ali Frazier. The anticipation of the championship game was extraordinary. It was the longest Sunday in between the Saturday semis and the Monday finals ever. It was the longest Monday Ever. Well, you'd have had to live under a rock to have not heard about Magic Johnson or Larry Bird. How good are they? Let's put it this way. They energize the entire floor. They not only compliment all the people on their teams, they do in fact make their teams. It was Larry Bird and, 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 and the white team, so to speak, against Magic Johnson and the black guys from the city and that sort of thing. So uh, uh, I, I think that had helped add spice to it. You really had an underdog team in Indiana State, unbeaten, and you had the, the, uh, the brutes from the Big Ten and, and the, the marvelous Magic Johnson on the other hand. All anyone talked about in Salt Lake City, Magic and Bird, Bird and Magic. And they became intertwined during that time in, in the uh, electronic media, and I think uh, it just evolved and they grew to where it was a showdown. I did not like Larry Bird, he didn't like me. Uh, not not because, you know, something happened, but because we were both going after the same thing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a numbers game at Salt Lake City. This is the 41st annual National Tournament Championship. And number 33 is a significant number. It is worn by Irvin Magic Johnson, and number 33 is also on the back of All-American Larry Bird. And the Sycamores have won 
33 in a row. But what's important is who is number one, and it will be decided in 40 minutes or more of play right here on this court. Perhaps we've never seen a final game with two greater individual players than Larry Bird, the player of the year from Indiana State, and the magic man from East Lansing, Urban Johnson. Here are their thoughts on tonight's final. Well, this is probably the biggest game I'll ever play in my life, and I just feel like, you know, I'm representing not only myself, my team, but we're representing our school and our, and our town, Terre Haute. And, you know, it means so much to me just to even be here that uh, we're going to give it all we got, and we're just going to try our hardest to win. Well, it's uh, a dream come true, really, for me. Uh, I won the state title back in my home state, and then my next accomplishment was going to the NCAA and playing in uh, a game like tonight in the finals. And, it's a dream come true, and uh, like I said, it's, it's awful important game, and just hope we play up the part and win the game. You know, a lot of people were surprised yesterday, Larry, when you mentioned that you played ball with Magic Johnson uh, in the World Invitational Tournament. Well, you know, me and Magic played together in that in that game, and you know, it's funny because Magic's such a great passer, but he wouldn't give me the ball. And, you know, and I need the ball. <laughs> well, uh, I hope he don't think I'm gonna pass it to him tonight either. But uh, I thought I'd pass him the ball. Maybe he forgot it. Or <laughs> <laughs> the bird against magic. All of the superlatives have been used, and believe me, all of them have been warranted. This crowd is going crazy. They are moments away from the big matchup. When we return to the story of the game, we will have the starting lineups and the tip-off in Salt Lake City. The 1979 NCAA championship game between Larry Bird's Indiana State Sycamores and Magic Johnson's Michigan State Spartans. This is ESPN Classic. Welcome back to the story of the game and our look back at the 1979 NCAA championship game. You know, back in March of 79, SportsCenter was still six months away from signing on. There was no national source for highlights. Larry Bird and Indiana State, they really were a national question mark. In fact, incredible as it seems now, even though the states of Michigan and Indiana are Midwest neighbors, the Spartan players were not even sure what this mystery man, this Larry Bird, even looked like. You know, it's funny. We had heard about Larry Bird uh, probably my junior year at Michigan State. He had started to make a lot of noise down there in, in, uh, in Indiana. And uh, we noticed that he was scoring a lot of points, grabbing a lot of rebounds. And to be honest with you, we thought Larry Bird was black. Um, we just thought that, hey, this guy is doing all this damage and and wreaking all this havoc on the other schools uh, in the Midwest, he's got to be a brother. <laughs> but he made the cover of Sports Illustrated, uh, I think in the off season coming into uh, the 1978 and 79 season, and, and he was flanked by two cheerleaders. And, and when we found out that he was a white kid, we, we were stunned. We were amazed. Greg Kelser and the Spartans are about to get up close and personal with Larry Bird for the next 40 minutes of basketball. Let's return out of Salt Lake City for the 1979 NCAA championship game. For Michigan State University, wearing number 32 at forward, 6 feet 7 inch tall, senior from Detroit, Michigan, Gregory Kelser. For Indiana State, wearing number 42 at forward, 6 foot 7 inch tall, junior from East St. Louis, Illinois, Alex Gilbert. For Michigan State, wearing number 12 at forward, 6 foot 4 inch sophomore from Windsor, Ontario, Michael Berkovich. For Indiana State, wearing number 33 at center, 6 foot 9 inch senior from French Lake, Indiana, Larry Bird. For Michigan State, wearing number 15 at center, 6 foot 7 inch junior from St. Croix, Virgin Islands, Ron Charles. For Indiana State, wearing number 23 at guard, 6'2'' sophomore from Warsaw, Indiana, Steve Reed. For Michigan State, wearing number 11 at guard, 6'2'' junior from St. Louis, Missouri, Terry Donnelly. For Indiana State, wearing number 22 at guard, 6'2'' junior from Chicago, Illinois, Carl Nix. And from Michigan State, wearing number 33 at guard, 6 foot 8 inch sophomore from Lansing, Michigan, Urban Magic Johnson. Welcome, please, the head coach of the Sycamores, Bill Hodges. And a welcome, please, for the head coach of the Spartans, Judd Heathcote. Judd Heathcote, 51 years of age. Indiana State's counterpart. 
Young Bill Hodges at 36. A chance to be a national champion. And one man knows that feeling so well. And you worked a long time, Al, to get there. Well, if uh, Hodges becomes it, he'll be the first rookie coach in 41 years to become the national champ. Set the scene again. Indiana State, only the 10th team in history to enter the Final Four unbeaten. Michigan State, as the Spartans break their huddle, they started slowly, were 5-4 and four after their first nine games, then won 20 of their last 22. And they have two legitimate great players in Johnson and Kelcher, the all-time leading Michigan State scorer. Kelcher is the third man in the ring, and that might be the difference in this game. I think the real key for the fans early is to watch how Bill Hodges decides to match up. Gilbert 42, Kelser of Michigan State 32. They're both 6-7. Michigan State control. Donnelly in the backcourt. The key, many feel, to beating Michigan State is to take the early lead. When the Spartans get in front in a hurry, they're really tough. Johnson traveling. Johnson tripped over a foot and it belongs to Indiana State. It was Brad Miley, a very good defensive basketball player, and he's the guy going to have that responsibility. 6'8", so there won't be any posted up, Al. 23, Steve Reed, unheralded, but an excellent shooter. A sophomore, and here's the great player, Bird. Reed open. Indiana State takes the early lead. Very interesting that Larry Bird is going ahead and playing the same kind of offense that they would against the man-to-man. I don't think Indiana State's going to be able to stay man to man. Michigan State will force him into his own. Ron Charles on a feed from Kelser ties it up. Now watch this double stack down here for Larry Bird to try to get open early. Carl Nix. Rebound Johnson. Magic Johnson with the ball. that Irvin Johnson can do is out of the zone matchup defense. He's a great rebounder and never has to make an outlet pass because he is the outlet pass himself. Nix cuts him out from underneath, but he made the shot anyway. Look at him. Just a sophomore. Many hope he'll stay around to compete on the collegiate level again next year. And also in the Olympics in Russia. Five to two, Michigan State on the three-point play by All-American Irvin Johnson. Basket will make him number five all time. Kelser rebounds. Johnson. With a magic. Not there. Bird rebounds. So it's from one great player to another, and Kelser knocks it out of bounds for Michigan State. Larry Bird also is a guy that can grab it off the boards and take it up court, not as flamboyantly as Johnson does, but he knows what he's doing when he has that ball. Larry Bird's trying to get in the middle of the zone and manhandle Charles in there. Turned over, two on two, Berkovitz. And Donnelly will slow it up. Kelser over the top to Indiana State. And you notice who's matched up with Kelser, Larry Bird, really taking on a big assignment both ends of the floor. I thought, I thought they put Bird on Charles because, he, you know, he's not expendable. But Bill Hodge is coming right at them. He's playing this game. Dumps it off to Gilbert. By the floor. Assist by Larry Bird. Bird's going to try to move through the matchup zone, taking men with him. It's awful difficult not to follow him through because when he gets it, he can make the play. Johnson to Kelser. The academic All-American can't hit it. Rebound, Bird. Indiana State has its first opportunity well after the opening bucket to take and regain the lead. Bird, 20-footer. And a foul on Donnelly for reaching in. Judd, he's got a little 
little upset with it, but Larry Bird right away, here comes a timeout coming up, has decided to go over on the other side of that zone. Here comes the play. Turnaround jump shot, not there. Dishes off inside. Gilbert goes up. He's a great leaper from inside. An interesting early timeout called by Michigan State's Judd Heathcote. We'll return with more from the 1979 NCAA championship when the story of the game continues on ESPN Classic. Welcome back to the story of the game and our look back at the 1979 NCAA championship game. The 1979 basketball season had certainly been a dream year for Larry Bird, Coach Bill Hodges, and the Indiana State Sycamores. Bird's three years at Terre Haute were already the stuff of legend, and in this final against Michigan State, he would pass Otis Birdsong to become the fifth leading scorer in NCAA history. But all of those numbers, all the stats, all the wonder of the NCAA final would never have happened if Larry Bird had stayed at his first college, Indiana University. I was a sophomore going to be a junior, and Coach Knight called me in and said, I just recruited, I just saw the best player I've ever seen play basketball in high school. I signed with Indiana because I thought he was the best coach in college basketball. They had a great program, and uh, I felt that my game could improve. I thought he had the best hands of any kid I'd ever seen, best hand-eye coordination. He was only 6'6 and weighed about 180 pounds at that time. And by the next summer, he was 6'9 and weighed 225 or 230. So he had that much growth after he graduated from high school. I just didn't fit in. I didn't fit in with the this, this environment. The surroundings wasn't uh, fitting for me. so. Uh, I made a decision uh, that I had to get out of there. After about two months of school, the kid was homesick, and Knight admits that he just didn't really do a good job of feeling this kid's sensitivity about homesickness. I was not as attuned to what his needs as an individual were as I should have been, and Larry went back home. I made the decision to leave, and I was going to stick by it. I had everybody talking to me, trying to get me to go back, but I couldn't. I mean, it, it wasn't for me, and I had to get out of there, and I did. Uh, you know, everything turned out fine now. If it didn't turn out, uh, I might have regretted it down the road or n even now, but um, everything turned out for the best, and it was the best decision I think I've, I've made in a long time. Well, everything did work out for Larry Bird, but as we get back to the 1979 NCAA championship game, Magic and the Spartans have opened up a six-point lead. It's 14 to 8, 14 minutes now remaining in the first half. As it was against Pennsylvania on Saturday, the Spartans from the Big Ten, the hot early shooting hand, the other team a bit cold. Well, Indiana uh, State is shooting from the perimeter, much more difficult shots. But Michigan State is uh, shooting from tight into the basket. You know, Dick, there's so much adrenaline flowing, but when you play against Michigan State early, you've got to be patient to look for some openings. You're not going to be able to get that shot up right away against the matchup zone they play. Greg Kelser looking for his fourth point. Michigan State now has doubled the score, 16 to 8. We played less than six minutes. And this out is where you say the zone gets tougher. Yes. They start backing that zone up, making it tougher and tougher to get it inside. Oh, he double dribbled yes, he it. Did. Got away with it. Bird dumps it off, and he was fouled by Donnelly. <laughs> Maybe the officials are a little psyched up, too. Carl Nix dribbled the ball twice. Larry made a little mistake then. When he felt the hand on him, he should have put the ball at the basket. It would have been an automatic two-shot foul instead of just a one-shot foul and taking the ball out the side. Ron Charles almost playing Bird man-to-man -man when he's in any area in the middle of that matchup zone. We're about to see our first substitute, Bob Heaton, who's checking in at the scores table. He's been their dramatic star, winning four games at the buzzer this year. He's a good outside shooter. Indiana State gets stronger as they move in their subs. Their sixth and seventh man are equal or better than their fourth and fifth man. Here comes Bob Heaton. He's from a small Indiana town, 150 population, Corey, Indiana. A good shooter. Dick, now they have an unusual defensive matchup, though, because they have three guards in the game, which is we're going to have to see which one of those three guards is going to take Magic Johnson for the simple reason that Miley would be uh, would have to go back inside. Bob Heaton is not a guard. He can play guard and play forward. Bird inside. The score. College basketball's player of the year, Larry Bird, has six points. Looks like Heaton's going to take the center position defensively. It's Charles. Kelser, 20-footer. Rebound. Miley. And here comes Indiana State. The Sycamores trail by six. 
15 minutes left, first half. Kyle Nix has got to start perking. I'm sure Judd Heathcote likes where he is, but if he puts a big man in the game right now, he'd sure have domination on the board. He misses, Kelser rebounds, and here's Magic Johnson for the ball. They don't give Magic Johnson a ball until he gets into the offensive end of the court. Johnson, Brown oh. Kelser scores. Got a break. Kelser is bleeding from the nose or mouth. They apparently was struck in getting that last rebound. right now bill hodges is a very small team in the game and you really have domination on the inside you got charles a great leaper in the middle kelser of course a great leaper and magic johnson all across the front line can get up there indiana state a little bit out man 18 to 10 michigan state look at the jam up around burn when he goes inside steve reed can't hit keep rebound foul on magic johnson he knew it yep. It was a good call, right? Came right across the lane. It's interesting, gentlemen, that if Indiana State wins, the Hoosier State will have two champions. The Hoosiers have already won the NIT. If yes, Indiana State wins, if Michigan State wins, then the Big Ten Conference will throw out its chest because they will have had the NIT and NCAA champs. Hoosier hysteria. Boy, they really are boxing in Larry Bird right now. He's got two men on him. They're going over to his side completely with the defense. Bird and Johnson in the back of that zone defense. Magic against Bird. See the two front men, Don Lee and Berkovich, they play the foul line extended. You take the foul line all the way to the side of the court. Here's the foul. Bird tips oh. it in. Larry Bird using that yeah. left hand. Remember, he has a broken left thumb on that left hand. Well, all he has to do with that, they're not allowed anything but a foam sponge and tape around it. That's an NCAA rule. 18 to 12, Michigan State with the ball and the lead. Magic Johnson from 15, and he loves to hit that backboard. Certainly can't hit the outside shot, can he? <laughs> eight for Johnson and eight for Bird so far. He's proven in this tournament particularly that he has nice range of a 15-foot, 18-foot shot to hit the ball. Good patience by Indiana State. They're not just firing up on the outside. They're looking to get the ball in. There's Nix inside. And the basket is allowed. A foul against Michigan State. There's Larry Bird constantly in motion trying to get position. You see Magic Johnson shielding one way. Here comes Charles over. Double teamed. He goes underneath the two. Puts it up left hand. Now watch him bounce for the offensive rebound. He is a tough player and a constant movement. He has complete control of his body. Foul was on Greg Kelser, Michigan State, his second. And Carl Nix looking for the three-point play. He just made his first points of the night. 20 to 15. The Spartans lead cut to five as we approach the halfway mark of this first 20-minute period. They're setting up a trap right now. Jay Vincent in the game. Now you really have the power team. Kelser sat down. There's Vincent. He can't connect it. Charles reps at home. Bobo Charles has six. He got in inside Leroy Staley that time. An easy tap, and he's very quick off his feet. Well, Bill Hodges realizes he's awful small across the front line right now. He's got that zone. Yeah. Check that zone from this long angle. You see how those white shirts really do jam inside. He was fouled. One of the reasons there is Vincent can't react that fast. He's only about 80% recovered from the foot injury. And here you have the bigger lineup coming back. I tell you, Bill Hodges, Judd Heathcote, two guys really staying with this ball game. Ron Charles has his first foul. Bob Heaton at the line. The matchups are so important physically in there. And now he has Staley and he has Gilbert and he has Bird in the front line and they can go up on the ball. 22 to 16, Heaton has his first point. Uh, Bob Heaton's got his arm point, a point pick machine with his 11 years of age. He got uh, 60 stitches in his left arm. 22 to 17, Michigan State by five. The winner, a 
places the University of Kentucky as basketball champions. Away from the ball, foul is on Leroy Staley, 44, just into the game for Indiana State. He's from Tampa, Florida, went to Jefferson High School there. He's just trying to get, make sure that Magic Johnson doesn't get the ball down low. He's trying to fight him off defensively before he ever handles it. You see it right here. Now watch him. He doesn't want Magic to get that ball. Using his hands, trying to get advantage, and there was the foul. Inside to Johnson, over Staley. Not there. Rebound Bird and a foul on Vincent of Michigan State over the top. That's a close call underneath there, Billy. Well, excellent position again by Larry Bird. Boy, he, he has his feet moving all the time. Gets in position both to score and to rebound. Greg Kelser sitting down over there, Dick. You have him down for two fouls or one? Pardon me, I believe Kelser down two. Two fouls. That's probably why he said. I believe in the first half you save a man for two fouls. In the second half you save a man for three. When he gets four fouls, let him go. He's no good to you. He's coming back in. The Sycamore is trying to cut into that five-point lead. Nine minutes, 40 seconds left. First half. Great halftime feature. Magic Johnson, Larry Bird to music in slow motion. Don't go away at halftime. There's Larry Bird's mother from Southern Indiana cheering her now famous son. She was funny the other night after the game. She said, too many turnovers. <laughs> 34 points, but she was looking at that turnover list. Her son committed 11 mistakes. Bob Heaton. Rebound Donnelly. The secondary players are not hitting that perimeter shot. Oh, my. great play by Bob. Oh, and he saves it. That was an alley-oop pass almost, trying to get it into Kelsey. Standing ovation from some of the fans, and they're not in the Indiana State section. Bird hanging, can't score. Johnson to Berkovich. Three on two. Vincent fouled by Heaton, number 30. Bob Heaton gets the foul. He stopped the easy layup. Larry Bird, a little upset with himself, missing that shot. Here you go, Magic Johnson throwing it up, and look at Bird hustling down the floor. Now, he was under the basket when that play started to develop. Went the full 90 feet for the interception. The bird that flies the highest sees the forest. <laughs> Al McGuire, March 1979. Is that farthest or forest? Forest. I, I still don't know. Jay Vincent, he's from Lansing, Michigan. Same class as Irvin Johnson. They were high school competitors near the Michigan State campus. That's Vincent's first point. He's playing on a very sore right foot. Nine minutes left in the first half. They need this basket right here. Larry Bird's getting buried in that zone a little bit. Oh, oh next hammer down on two corners. It's very important. Carl Nix got to start penetrating into the zone, then either kick off or shoot the ball. Larry Bird with the arm, says the official, as Kelser left him in his tracks. Kelser is lightning quick with that first step. Larry Bird trying to figure him out a little bit defensively. He's, he's going to back off him now because he's beating him with a first step. He can't play a man-to-man -man out on the side when they isolate him. He pushed with his left arm inside that time. And what's asking him, you know, physically to go and play Kelso and one into the floor and then be constantly moving in the offensive end is tough. Team fouls, both have six. Johnson can't connect, gets his own rebound, and can't score. Foul underneath. Apparently on Gilbert, and now a shooting foul. Both teams from now on will go to the one-to-one. -one. Gilbert, a great leaper at junior college. He high jumps seven feet. He hopes after basketball or with basketball, he might take it to Moscow as a high jumper. He has a 40-inch vertical jump. Magic Johnson, incredibly fine free throw shooter, and there's a member of the Johnson family. I believe that's his grandfather. Jesse Johnson. like he broke his wing that time when he's laying on the floor. Here we'll see it right here. He's going up. A lot of bodies battling. No question about the foul. He got knocked to the floor. Here it is again. A bird and a foul. Definitely got fouled right here. Watch him get knocked to the floor, and they say it's Michigan State out of bounds.
We'll return with more from the 1979 NCAA championship when the story of the game continues on ESPN Classic. Welcome back to the story of the game and our look back at the 1979 NCAA championship game. Magic and the Spartans are looking impressive. They're up by five, but eight weeks earlier, on the first day of February, Michigan State was looking like anything but a championship team as they got ready to host the Ohio State Buckeyes. Well, we had a tremendous dry spell. Uh, we were four and four in the league, and we had lost at Northwestern, which is unheard of. Another loss probably eliminates us from uh, the championship, and that was when only two teams from a conference would go, so uh, we were not guaranteed anything. So when we came up against Ohio State, we were at a position where we could not lose any more games. It was as simple as that. Uh, Magic injures his ankle in the uh, first half, and at halftime, while the doctors indicated that he was not going to be able to play, so uh, we're probably uh, oh, five or six points down when suddenly there's this tremendous roar. And it's amazing because I, I put Gregory Kelzer in the game. He's at the scoring bench. And he hears this. He says, you know, I, I, I knew I was popular, but I didn't think going back in I'd get that kind of a reaction. Judd Heathcote likes to tell the story that I thought the standing ovation was for me because I was coming back into the game, but that, that's not true. I mean, it sounds good, but I knew when the folks got up and, and started cheering and raising the roof on Jenison that Irvin must have uh, emerged from the, uh, the, the tunnel area and, and was making his way back out onto the court. So I was just as happy. In fact, I felt like standing up and applauding myself. I've never heard uh, maybe noise that loud as Jensen Fieldhouse at that time and the reaction. And Irvin came in and, and uh, led us to victory, and, and uh, uh, that was the game that we had to win, and we won 10 consecutive games to get in the NCAA tournament. Uh, he had a major impact on that game and, and was hobbled pretty much the, the rest of the time that he was in there, but we got the win, and that sort of got us on our way. As we return now to the 1979 NCAA championship game, Magic and the Spartans are leading Larry and the Sycamores. The score is 24 to 19. There's that man-to-man -man out of bounds again, Al. Burn, blocked. Heaton can't save it. What a hustle effort by Heaton. He was out of bounds anyway. But Bird showing defensively his great timing as well. It's a real competitor as all the great players of all-time in college basketball are beautiful block. Inside Vincent. Oh, goaltending, and it would not have gone in. That's goaltending, but a mistake made by Staley. The ball was not on line. Here comes Miley in the ball game to take him on out of there. Staley at times coming in off the bench. We'll see it here, and you were right, Dick. It never would have gone into the basket. But I think what Bill Hodges does well in the substitutions, he gives a try, Al, as you pointed out. His sixth and seventh men may be better than his fourth and fifth, but he gives them a try, he gets them back in there later. He never takes the ball play out of a game for a mistake. He takes them out for defensive or offensive adjustment. Larry Bird. Way on the top, but Kelser can't handle the rebound. Kelser not only the all-time great scorer in Michigan State history, but their top rebounder again this year. Bird hasn't yet found out where he really wants to get the ball against this matchup zone. Indiana State, 19, 8 minutes left, first half. And your space eaters in the middle, Al. Jay Vincent, number 31, takes up a lot of room inside that zone. That's a tough matchup. Kelser very nearly stole it, and he did deflect it off the hands of Larry Bird. They don't get the ball to Magic Johnson until they get into the offensive zone. Kelser, 18-footer, not there. Rebound, Gilbert, and a foul on Johnson. His second, Magic Johnson. The agony of the whistle. Yeah, it's hard to believe there. That was a little touch foul on Magic, and the before we had a guy blasted to the floor. Bill Hodges, young Indiana State coach. Some of you watching Indiana State, Michigan State for the first time. Bill Hodges took over as the head coach this year when Bob King, a veteran coach at Indiana State, suffered a heart attack and then surgery for a brain aneurysm. Bob King is here, recuperating. He's still the athletic director and cheering. Young Bill Hodges, first year head coach, perfect 33-0. Way off the line, 
Gilbert, notoriously bad free throw shooter, but Byrne gets it. Can't score. Out of bounds. Well, I believe Indiana State got a break on that one. It appeared to touch Gilbert last. Alex Gilbert shoots 27% from the foul line. When he makes one down in Terre Haute, the whole student body stands up and applauds him. You were trying to challenge him to a little one-on-one -on -one yesterday. He, he almost breaks the glass when he shoots a foul shot. 26 to 19. Boy, that defense clogs things up so beautifully. Bird, way short. That was partially blocked by Berkovich. Knicks. Beautiful pass to Gilbert and a foul on Berkovich. You saw Johnson leap in the air. Magic thought they were going to call it on him. Knicks is stunned to create problems inside the zone. Now they have to have this. Knicks got to have a good game to neutralize uh, the zone inside. He has to Ever penetrate. Seen? That's a pretty good block coming over the top by Berkovich. Had his hand right on the ball. Gilbert again, 27% free throw shooter. Incredible. He is now, this year, 20 out of 77. You know what's amazing about him, too, is the fact that he has decent form. It, it's got to be concentration on his part. He's well, 0 for 3. Luke Chamberlain had the same problem. I believe he should play the shot off the backboard, and if it misses, at least the rebound would go further out into the area where you have your own men. Inside is Vincent to score, and Michigan State now has jumped into a 9-point lead. Seven minutes left, first half. Sycamores really need a bucket this trip down court. Gerd with a good save. One hand. In. Larry Bird's getting a little frustrated now because he can't find an opening in which he can get his offensive move started. You watch, he drops his shoulder in a moment, gets right. the ball over here, gives a head fake. Watch this, he gives a head fake. Now he drops his shoulder in. Yeah, it's really it. And he didn't barely touch Kelser. Pretty good acting job by Kelser. Oh. Well the right oh. The state uh, scores here. Indiana has to call a timeout. And Magic Johnson hanging and hitting a 12-footer. 30 to 19, the Spartans lead. 6.28 remaining in the first half. No timeout call by the Sycamores. Anytime Larry Bird touches it, there are about three people in his area. Bird left alone. He's automatic. Doesn't tighten up. No. Puts the shot up the same way every time. He missed about four shots in a row. The fifth one, exactly the same form. Ten points for Magic Johnson. Ten points for Larry Bird. Vincent's doing a good job out there. Well, Judd Heathcote said he'll play as long as hard as he has to. Johnson inside, follows his own shot. And Bird saves it. 30-21, Michigan State. Five and a half minutes remaining. First half. Steve Reed has to start shooting from the top of that key. Nix will fire and hit. Carl Nix has hit two in a row, has seven points. Now Magic Johnson's moving to the backcourt. Going to start his own offense. Finally on it. Here's a forward playing against the guard because Johnson at 6'8 creates unusual problems. Defensively, out of bounds to Michigan State. When Magic Johnson brings the ball up, he's going to pass off to one of the guards, then post up. I'm out. Five minutes, 14 seconds left in the first half. We'll return with more from the 1979 NCAA championship when the story of the game continues on ESPN Classic. Now let's return to the 1979 NCAA championship game. Each with 10 points. Each with one assist, and Bird has two more rebounds. Middle over five minutes left to go for the half. Kelser off to Johnson, wide open. Kelser has become the assist man in this first half. So we really have four front court men in the game right now for Michigan State, and Berkovich is a good lead for it about six four. They've changed their zone defense completely. Next, way off the mark, rebound Charles. Johnson, three on one. Here it comes. a very critical time for Indiana State because this is a massive lineup that Michigan State has in the game right now. 
Oh, the pitch beat into that zone. Somebody has to be open when they collapse the zone. Two men on a wing. Bird deep in the corner. Push off. Urban Johnson pushing for Michigan State. And Magic Johnson has his third foul. Here we're going to see the play. Of course, Kelsey's already moved, getting himself in position. Look at the timing here between those two great individuals. Magic Johnson this year. I don't believe he's fouled out. Maybe once. No, five times he's fouled out. I remember. During the year. They don't have that on their statistical sheet. But three fouls to sit down. The Magic Man has to hurt Michigan State. If nothing else, just emotionally, he gives that team such a spirit. We'll return with more from the 1979 NCAA Championship when the story of the game continues on ESPN Classic. Welcome back to the story of the game and our look back at the 1979 NCAA Championship game. The second half is about to get underway. Magic and the Spartans lead Larry and the Sycamores 37 to 28. Michigan State outscoring, out shooting from the floor and the free throw line, leading by nine points as we open the second half. Same five players will start for each club. That means that Irvin Johnson, Greg Kelser with three fouls, and Alex Gilbert of Indiana State also playing with three. Kelser, Gilbert, jump it off. They're both going to go upstairs on this. Kelser got it in the first half. Gilbert got it in that half, but he went back to Johnson. We introduce the players for you. Don Lee and Berkovich in the backcourt presently with Charles Johnson posting up and Kelser for Michigan State. Next and Reed, the guards for Indiana State. Bird, Wiley, Gilbert, the front line. Kelser, he hits it, danced at home. Boy, he felt the defensive pressure coming from the weak side that time and pulled up for the jumper. Michigan State's biggest lead was 12 points in the first half. Indiana State led last at 8-7 early in the game. Steve Reed's got to shoot. Put it up. Wide open. Can't hit it. Rebound, Charles. Magic Johnson. Now they're just ignoring Reed. And, of course, Miley in the particular. Any kind of offensive structure they have, that's hurt them. Terry Donnelly. That's how the game began, with a little left-hander hitting a jumper from the side. He has four points, one early in the game, one early in this half. We can watch him coming down. All the pressure is completely on Larry Bird right now. Look at the pressure around him. Two, three, net. And he's short. The second half does not start well for the Sycamores. Johnson going outside, directing that offense. He's switching with Donnelly a little bit. Almost turned it over. Back door to Charles. And he is fouled. Gilbert has his fourth. That's one of the problems in playing man-to-man, -man, overplaying. You're vulnerable to the backdoor pass. If you notice in this, he goes high, then goes back door on Gilbert. And obviously, it should have been a simple dunk. He caught him for his fourth foul. It'll be two shots in the line. No move by Bill Hodges to replace Gilbert. Well, he's down now. He's going to have to play for all the marbles. Ryan Charles from the Virgin Islands. He was a member of the Virgin Island Pan American team at the age of 16. One shot, man. He started the first 19 games this year. The break of it's knocked him out of the dark spot. Charles has his seventh point, and Michigan State enjoys its widest margin of this game, 14 points. Charles, everybody follow Larry Bird wherever he goes. They just won't let him touch that ball, which means Reed's got to be open. Bird, short again, highly rebounds. Just going for a timeout. The game getting away from his team. Michigan State has the ball, has a 14-point lead. We'll return with more from the 1979 NCAA Championship when the story of the game continues on ESPN Classic. Welcome back to the story of the game and our look back at the 1979 NCAA Championship game. Magic and the Spartans are up comfortably right now, 14 in the second half. 
Larry Bird, he's being held in check. One reason might be the plan devised by Judd Heathcote. After his team beat Penn in the national semifinal, Heathcote had a unique way to prepare his team to defend the National Player of the Year. Indeed, before Magic Johnson could play against Larry Bird, Magic had to be Larry Bird. We had not faced an opponent like Larry Bird, so uh, we really didn't have anybody on our scouting team. First, no one was six foot nine. No one could shoot it from the outside like Larry. No one could pass like him. So what we did, we took Magic, put him on the second unit, and you're Larry Bird. Judd came over to me. I don't know Judd. E. He called me E. Look here. We want you. You know, Judd does this a lot. We want you to be on the scout team. I want you to play Larry Bird. Every time you touch it, shoot it. Okay, you got that? I got it, coach. That was probably the best shooting day he's ever had. Oh, man. I didn't miss but two shots. He was dropping jump shots from all over the place. I was so hot. And it was shooting like Larry, off balance and everything. My teammates were so mad at me because Judd was just screaming at him. How can we win if you don't guard him? That's Larry Bird. Get on him. And, and so Greg Kelso grabbed me. Quit making us look bad. <laughs> I said, I can't help it. I'm hot. <laughs> Guarding Irvin. As Larry Bird on Sunday was much tougher than guarding the actual real Larry Bird that Monday. We were quite ready. Something was working for Heath Coach team. Bird at the half was held to only 31% from the floor, and that's well below his career average of 53. As we go back to Salt Lake City, Magic and the Spartans are hoping that Larry Bird doesn't find the range. Michigan State leading 42 to 28. It's early in the second half. The 1979 National Championship game, and Larry Bird has had a cold shooting night, but obviously a great defense from the Spartan hawking him throughout. Plenty of time left. There's over 17 minutes left. Johnson pass deflected out to Berkovich. Both teams are playing good defense. Nobody getting anything easy out here. Indiana's trying to trap. Kelser and Bird are matched up on the Indiana State defense. There they are. And Kelser from behind the backboard nails one. That was a great shot. Fading away, spinning the opposite direction. 16-point lead, 17-15 left. Kelser has 13 to lead all scores. See Magic Johnson and Ron Charles have it sandwiched in. Basket is good. The foul is on Terry Donnelly. Donnelly of Michigan State, his second foul. Here he, here he is, Dick. Look at they having sandwiched in completely. You just can't get him the ball. When he gets it, he's trying to force a little bit. I think he should stay underneath like that and look for inside position. Let the other ball to shoot because every time he gets a rebound, it'd be two points or possibly a three-point play. Knicks unable to get the three-point play, but he looking for a four-point. No foul. Indiana State fans unhappy. They wanted a whistle. Magic double team. There's the trap you were talking about, Al, but men are going to be open like Terry Donnelly. Here's the little guard, rarely shoots, averages five, six points a game, but when he's open, he's deadly. He's the quarterback. He's steady. He does his job. Anything to win the game. That zone is backed in inside the foul line area now, so Bird's really going to have a problem. Take some step jumpers. He has to take a shot. Bob Heaton connects. And it's 46 32. 16 minutes left. That's basically the same play we saw before. Man going up with a jumper. If he doesn't leave the floor, he's all right. Donley's. Terry Donley hits again. The junior from St. Louis, Missouri, averaging six points a game, has eight tonight on four 15 footers. Carl Nix, not there, rebound Berkovich. Berkovich 
gets hit in the face, but he's okay. Bergman's a good leaper, about six foot four, so that gives them a, a, a big guard in there, along with a good size. Foul is on Kelser, number four, as Bird had position, and Kelser called for charging. He wanted to take Larry one-on-one -on -one that time, Billy. Here it is, Billy. Here we see it now. It's going to be a big factor right here, the foul situation. Didn't quite see the completion of the charge, but Kelser unable to get around Bird, who was taking... Here it is. Here we see him trying to go. Larry Bird moves in excellent position, shoulder to shoulder, draws the charge. So Kelser leading the game and scoring with 13 is out with four fouls. Number 31, Jay Vincent, has replaced him for Michigan State. The Spartans out shooting the Sycamores by plenty. I don't want to hurt the Magic fans, but I think Ray Kelsey is the most important man on the spot. Carl next is open and hits. He has an unorthodox shooting shot, and it turns his wrist. But that shot's available. You know, with a 16-point spread, I feel the momentum turning now for Indiana State. Let's see what happens. Great passing by Michigan State, and Conley is four for four. That's what makes the Magic so great. Instead of trying to penetrate in here when it's not available, hit the ball around to the free man. Heaton from 18, and he connects, and suddenly the pace quickens. They've got to pick up all over the court, put more pressure on. Gamble on a double team, there it is. Up, he was back and over. That's it. Traveling against Berkovich, who put on the brakes, but went from the front court to the back court. Watch Judd to call a timeout. He's losing the momentum of the game. A he lot of good pressure up here. Magic Johnson throws a very tough pass for Berkovich to have to handle right there, and a good job by Larry Bird defense. And again, Bird, not known for his defense, makes big plays at that end, too. Bird! connect and he grimaces as that ball refused to fall for him. That's the second time he was in good position down in low as a man on his back. They're sliding the man to the deep corner. That leaves Bird open under there against Jay Vincent. Puts it right up and he wanted this one. Boy, such a soft touch even at that. It just danced on the rim. Oh, my boy, my ball! Stay here! Stay here! Boy, it's not the Larry Bird that has shot Indiana State. Through a 33 and all year. The fouls have been hurting them, but I still feel they're on the come. 50 37. Michigan State with 14 minutes plus remaining. This full court pressure really did a good job against Arkansas. Berkovich is open. Rebound, Staley, 44 of the Sycamore. Indiana State trying to cut into that big Michigan State advantage. Next time down, Al, you can, I think you can look for Judd Heathcote to try to get his team calmed down with a timeout. I thought he would have done it the last time. Two men on Bird, Johnson and Vincent. Nix off to Staley. Basket is good, and the foul is on Charles. Oh, my. Judd, Judd's going on over there. Crazy. Judd has to watch out for a technical foul. Here's the dish in here. Good penetration by Nix. Now watch it right here. Staley just bangs into him, knocks him down. The basket counts. You got to question the call. Would you have been on your feet, Al? Um, I'd be on top of the bench. <laughs> <laughs> I like vocabulary in those situations. But that's part of momentum, getting the calls, and now they get a jump ball. So things are turning a bit, and as you've said, in the course of 40 minutes, everyone's going to have their turn. The momentum will flow, and now it appears to be Bill Hodges getting the breaks. And you know when you're 33-0, you guys are never going to quit. They've been behind before. There's the time. They had a call. John Heathcock angry at the officials and worried now about this game with Kelser on the sidelines. We'll be back. 11-point Michigan State advantage. We'll return with more from the 1979 NCAA championship when the story of the game continues on ESPN Classic. Welcome back to the story of the game. Now, the 1979 NCAA championship game was the first of several classic meetings between Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. In their NBA careers, 
Bird and Magic met 37 times, and Bird Celtics won 15, Magic Lakers won 22 times. If you ask Larry Bird to pick one of his all-time favorite games, he will mention a game against the Lakers, but what's surprising, in this game, Magic Johnson was not even in uniform. Among the, 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 hand, the, the short list of Larry Bird's favorite games that uh, was a game on February 11, 1981 in the, in the forum. I got a pool hamstring, so I'm not playing tonight. So they're warming up, warming up, and the buzzer about to sound. So before the buzzer sound, about a minute to go, he walks down to me. Man, I'm sorry you're not playing, but I, he said, I'm going to tell you what. Since you're here, I'm going to put a show on for you. So you just sit back and watch, okay? He had 36 points, 21 rebounds, uh, six assists, took at least three charges while breaking up three-on-one fast breaks, and did all this while Magic was enjoying a front row view. And my mouth is just open. Every time he hit one, he look at me. Like he was saying, this is for you. <laughs> And after that game, Jerry West walked into the Celtic locker room to congratulate Larry Bird, and he told me that what he liked above all the statistical things, all the shots, all the passes, all the rebounds, was that he had, quote, been two steps ahead of everybody in thought for the entire game. Uh, it was a, a magnificent canvas filled with everything good about basketball. One of the greatest single performances I've ever watched. And... Um... That, that was just unbelievable. As we return to the 1979 championship game, Larry Bird will need his stroke from that game against the Lakers this night against Magic Spartans. And fate and fouls were beginning to help Bird and the Sycamores. First, All-American Greg Kelser picked up his fourth foul. He had to sit down. Then Jay Vincent drew his fourth foul. He was forced to the bench. Bird and the Sycamores gained momentum. They whittled the Spartan lead down to six, but Magic and the Spartans spurted ahead. And now, just under seven minutes to go, Michigan State is up by nine. If Indiana State doesn't score this time, the next time down, I believe that Michigan State will spread it out a little bit, try to isolate Kelcher on the side with Larry Bird. That'll be a good move in a couple of ways, now because Kelcher with those foul situations can help move that clock down a little for him. Ron Charles is the man hawking Bird most of the time in that zone. Now Urban Johnson has him. Good pass. Carl Nix, son of a Baptist minister from Chicago, rattles in another bucket. He has 15. Less than six minutes left. They're still running their offense. Indiana State having a hard time keeping that ball away from Magic. He comes out and beats it so well. He easily evades the steal try by Staley. Kyle Nix will double team the first chance he gets. Berkovic a good reverse on the dribble into Kelser. Knocked away by Bird and saved by Ron Charles. Second great pair of hands on Charles in the last 30 seconds. Saved two balls from going out of bounds. Seven points, Spartan lead. Trying to run out that clock now. And here goes Johnson. And the foul is on number 30 of Indiana State, Bob Heaton. He can't believe it. Good backdoor move. And it spread out fairly well. And everybody expected Johnson to come to the ball. Goes back door. Here he is. Heaton waiting on him. When we get back to that call, a man up in the air has to have room to come down. Urban Johnson looking for the three-point play and the bench for the Indiana State Sycamore is showing more emotion now than we've seen any time in the tournament. The reason for it, Dick, they're calling it another two-shot foul, saying the man was cut. Now, that's, that's a referee's interpretation. I don't think that he maliciously cut him out from underneath, but the rule states that an airborne man, you cannot step in underneath it. That's the second time they call it today, Bill. They call it at the top of the program, they call right. it now. It's a very difficult call, unless you've been calling all year. To start calling this a championship game, I don't think it's right. I got to buy that. They've it all year, isn't it? We've seen it twice tonight. Well, we had one in the game in the semifinals, a definite cut, and that was not called. 21 points from Magic Johnson, a four-point play. And Michigan State has an 11-point lead. Burn. Boy, a lot of heart out here in the part of both.
both of these ball clubs right now. Clock becomes a factor. 19 points for Byrne and a foul on Knicks of Indiana State. And again, Bill Hodges off the bench. I hope we can catch this one on the replay. Here we go, Bergovich coming down. Knicks, great athletic ability. I don't know why, Al. Why is that a foul on Knicks? I um, I gotta let that one go by. <laughs> it's not been a well officiated game. I think we can make that comment. They've had some problems, and uh, it's the pressure, and they're doing the best they can. But we've seen some unusual calls both sides. Looked like the man fell down that time, and the ref might have been at the wrong angle. But they've been going both ways with the calls. When they're incompetent, they'd be consistently incompetent, which isn't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little strong. <laughs> The Catbird seat, four and a half minutes to go, and the Spartans have a big 11-point lead. They get nine, nine one. And they got a spread offense going right now. This is not their normal offense. Timeout, Michigan State. Plenty of time, four minutes and 25 seconds left with Michigan State leading Indiana State 61-52. We'll return with more from the 1979 NCAA championship when the story of the game continues on ESPN Classic. Now let's return to the 1979 NCAA championship game. Now down to the final four and a half minutes. Definitely a spread offense now. Magic tough to handle in this. He meets the ball so well. They get Kelser and Charles Lowe and let Berkovich and Johnson work outside. Yardley just kind of stays out of the way. Five seconds, jump ball, Miley and Johnson. Now Judd Heathcote is saying he crossed the midcourt line on his dribble, therefore he'd get another five seconds to go. Be careful of a tee, Judd. Talking to the expert there. Yep, yep. <laughs> Johnson has the height advantage. But the tip, it'll be another jump ball this time. Charles and Gilbert. Now Gilbert has the leaping advantage. Well, well these are two sky hooks going up here this time. If the fans would just watch how high they get off the court on this jump ball. That's a smart play by Charles. He knew he couldn't make a play, so he just went down and smothered the ball. That's three smart plays last minute. Watch their feet, how high up they get. Alex stole it on him. Next with the ball, Indiana State trails by nine. They've got to put it up. Oh, they got plenty of time. Really. Good defense by Charles. Foul is on home. Charles of Michigan State. Four on Charles. Vincent, Charles, Kelser. All with four for Michigan State. Johnson picked up three in the first half. Is clean the second half. Larry Bird really hasn't had a shot blocked tonight, but he's had a lot of shots altered by real good defense inside. Charles doing a good job. Kelser, and when Jay Vincent was in there, he was doing a good job. Here comes the left hand up there. He must concentrate. These are big foul shots. You got to put them over the front rim. It drops home. He is two for five tonight. 16 points for Knicks. That one was a crier. It bounced all around the rim. Now Johnson comes back to the ball and meets it so well. Oh, Larry Bird! He just reached out a knee hook and grabbed that one. Good head fake on Bird. Berkovich thought he was going to stay inside. He went outside. Steve Reed from 20 is short. Bird keeps it alive. Gilbert, foul, Charles. Ron Charles, fifth. Personal foul, he is disqualified. Boy, did Gilbert get up in the air that time. The odds are he will not make this first foul shot, but let's see. Larry Bird really upset with himself. The ball slipped right out of his hand. Here we're going to go see him battling for the rebound. I said his shots have been altered tonight. He recognizes. Look at how high up he put that ball. Here comes Gilbert. Head almost equal to the rim. Takes it up. Gets fouled on the way up. Charles leaves with seven points. He contributed with some key baskets and key saves. And Jay Vincent, limping, number 31, returns for the Spartans. He has four fouls. 
Here's that head fake by Bird. They thought he was going to stay inside, faked a little bit, good hands on the outside. It looked like a professional ping pong play there when he got that ball. Hey, Dick, you really hit it on the head when you said Jay Vincent lipped in. I think that leg probably wearing down a little bit on him, and he can hardly run down the floor. Look at him. You still have to shoot free throws. It's still 15 feet away, and all legs. And Indiana State has not been able to hit their charities, and that's the difference in this game. Again, that was a one-and-one, one, Dick. Spartans running down the clock, 305, 304, 303. They lead by seven. Good pass. Forced the defense to run all the way across the court. Now, earlier, Kelser would have driven for that ball, but that's not the intent. Here comes Magic. It looks like they're going into a complete freeze. Nicks got a piece of the wrist of Berkovich. And for Carl Nix, he leaves the game with five. And that is a critical loss to Indiana State. Following our basketball telecast tonight, it's been a very big day for all of us around the world. The signing of the Mideast Treaty celebration. Yet caution, David Brinkley reports for NBC News immediately following the final buzzer. Nix leaves with 17 points. He'll be back next year. Little consolation at this moment. Been a great run for this ball team. Still some time left, 243. The fouls have really been critical. Number 20, Rich Nemchik from Hammond, Indiana, Jr. It'll be local news following our telecast, and that will be followed by the NBC News Special on the Mideast Peace Treaty. Oh, a rare miss by Berkovich. A big break for Indiana State. Well, that ball went up there off the hard. Larry Bird way outside. Can't hit. Great, great rebound by Kelsey. What a rebound. And you can hear Magic hollering in the back. Great, great. And he spotted him just with a sound as opposed to visual. Turnover, Donnelly. Oh, Judge going crazy. Well, what happened that time, Berkovich changed direction, and Donnelly got caught high with the ball. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. Bob Heaton with an air ball. So Indiana State, everyone trying so hard, but the pressure all on the shoulders of the Sycamores. Two minutes left. Michigan State took the lead at 9-8 early in the game, have not relinquished it, built up a 16-point lead. Indiana State carved it away and pulled within five, but Michigan State leads by seven and only two minutes left. Indiana State has had its opportunities. Well, you'll never know when you miss those front ends of one and ones how many points that can mean for you. They've had to miss at least three or four. Berkovich gives the Spartans an eight-point lead. They're only one minute, 59 seconds away from the first ever National Basketball Championship to a Michigan University. The best they did was years ago when North Carolina State, North Carolina, led by Frank McGuire, beat them in triple overtime. That was in the semifinals. Yep. They had jumping Johnny Green. Heaton inside with a left-hand prayer, and he gets it back. That was almost the kind of shot he beat Arkansas with. Gilbert inside. Great play by Johnson. He stole the ball. The Magic Man pulled out the rabbit. He has not thrown the ball away at all tonight. He hadn't had a chance to make spectacular passes. Foul out of desperation by Reed of Indiana State, his second. They've got to foul somebody, but all the guys out there handling the ball can shoot these fouls. Now here we see the play. Inside, Alex Gilbert has it right where he'd love to have it. Magic comes down over the top, just strips him of the ball. Slight of hand by the Magic man. Yep, he has Houdini hands. Real good free throw shooters in the game right now, handling that ball from the his face. Spartans now lead by nine, Terry Donnelly looking for his 12th point. And Dick, we talked about unsung heroes when this game started. Terry Donnelly's been a man since a big clutch shot. Yeah, those four shots from the outside were just at the right time. 126 left. St. 
Sycamores have to score and score in a hurry. Nemchek banks it in his first basket. Timeout, Indiana State with a score 63, 56, and 117 left. We'll return with more from the 1979 NCAA championship when the story of the game continues on ESPN Classic. Welcome back to the story of the game and our look back at the 1979 NCAA championship game. Magic Johnson, Greg Kelser, Judd Heathcote, the Michigan State Spartans, they are now less than two minutes away from being crowned national champions. Reality was coinciding with a premonition that Larry Bird had earlier that season. I didn't know much about Magic. Uh, I remember the first time I seen him play it was my senior year, and they were playing against the Russians. And, uh, you know, they were dunking and passing. He, you could tell he had control of the game from the beginning. And we played the Russians that year, too, and we had a close game. They beat them, I don't know, 15 points, 20 points. But you could just tell that he was a great basketball player. And it's the first time I seen him play, and I was telling the guys right then that that team is going to win the championship this year. Now less than 90 seconds remaining. Back to Salt Lake for the conclusion of this 1979 championship game. Michigan State leading 63 to 56. Jay Vincent can hardly walk out here. That leg is really bothering him. To get the ball to the man, they want to be in control. Irvin Johnson. No one should feel sad for Indiana State if they don't win. They've done a magnificent job. They're a great ball player. Foul is on Reed. That stops the clock with 106 left. And sends Donnelly to the line. Reed's third foul. It's not a bad move. Try to steal the ball, but get the foul. They can't afford to let the clock keep moving. Joe Hodges, Judd Heathcote. One of the sad aspects of this tournament. 40 start and 39 lead losers. Only one can smile for the months ahead. I think we'll get a good smile from Judd. The whole, the whole tournament has been very intense. He doesn't fool around with the ball game. He makes sure he has it won before he makes any substitutions. Donnelly now has 13 points. And Michigan State leads by nine. Reed hits a long 25-footer. Time out of time. Indiana State. What happened there, Dick? Larry Bird grabbed the ball right out of the basket and called time. Donnelly said, hey, you can't get away with that one. Larry Bird, and I know a lot of fans who have watched him all season long are saying, oh, if he had just had an average shooting game, we'd be national champions. But again, he has played under such tremendous defensive pressure. Michigan State, Magic Johnson, Greg Kelso, they were the world's fans tonight. Now yeah, they're the best team we saw the last month of this year. There's no question about it. They're on an uptick. They hit a little drought in the middle of the season. And then they were off to the races. Now let's give some credit to their league, too. I think that's what made them such a competitive team. The Big Ten this year had some incredible competition. Maybe the greatest year a conference has ever had in the country. Bill Hodges, he graduated from Marion College in Indiana in 1970 after four years in the Air Force. An assistant coach, and let's pay tribute to those men, too. The assistants often overlooked. They struggle. They work for years and years behind the head man before they get their chance. Under adversity, Hodges replacing the physically ill King, and he's had a great year. And Judd Heathcote, his counterpart, several years at the University of Montana. A surprise pick by Michigan State. And now the Spartans starting to show the victory smiles. Bill Hodges knows it's all but over. He trails by nine, 49 seconds left. Ooh, oh, a tremendous whoa. collision at midcourt. Wow. And what's the call? The call is against Nemchik of Indiana State. He's the one that had the offensive foul, too, but they're battling out there, and Indiana State had to take the gamble out for that steal to allow the long pass. Wow, well, they're going to call two fouls on that again, but Double. he stepped in, and they really hit each other. I'm pleased no one's hurt. There's 48 seconds left, and there comes the cry out for Michigan State Spartans. They're number one, and they are number one. They and their number the one player, Urban Magic Johnson, wins for his university $5,000.
$1,000 during the regular year, $5,000 in this championship game. Very few can argue that that sophomore, I, I, I said today, someone asked me, if I could put a name on the back of his uniform, I would write joy. The joy for this game, the joy that he has brought his fans and anyone who loves basketball. As Joe said, he's the best ball player in the country, pro, college, or high school. Reed comes back to get two from That's going to be a technical foul. Going to be a technical foul. What happened? Larry Bird slapped the ball away from Magic Johnson while he was out of bounds. It's automatic technical foul. Hey, you have to pull all the stops when you get here. What a great ball player Larry Bird is, but this was accurately called right here. Now watch it. The ball is Isn't that Magic's out of bounds. Isn't that normally a warning first on that when you break no, the plane, no, Billy? No, no, no. That's well called. That's there a good call is. by the official yep. because Bird was very quick in his move. A little frosting for Magic Johnson. Michigan State 69, Indiana State 60. Johnson leads all scores with 22. Bird 19 for Indiana State. Well, got the national champs, Michigan State. Look at Irvin Johnson. He turned to the official, two fingers out, saying, I, 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 he, he wants two. That's Magic says, I'm no one, just one. That was intentional. Larry Bird telling his teammates, hey, we got nothing to be sad about, but let's just keep playing solid ball here. You don't want to turn the game into a farce. Can we say Al McGuire? Two stars were just a bit too much for one. Well, as I said earlier in the show, the third man in the ring was the deciding factor, Greg Kelsey. Yeah, Johnson against Bird, both legitimate All-Americans, both big men. A new evolution of the game, the big man with the great passes, but Michigan State also had Greg Kelsey. And you know, thinking back to last year when Kentucky went all the way through, this Michigan State team was a year younger, but they almost knocked off the Kentucky Wildcats last year in that regional. Kentucky beat them by only three, 52 49. I also want to thank Larry Bird for giving us so many thrills this year and being a perfect gentleman. Gilbert has his 4.18 seconds. Johnson fouled by Bird. As those two great stars collide. <laughs> well, before this game started, Matt, oh, what a sight right there. Yeah, what they're saying, play to our potential. Play to our potential. That was just said, I think they said with their eyes, we did it. We did it. Yep. They're going to get their rings and their wristwatch and be proud of for the rest of their lives. Well, those memories will be a lot bigger than any kind of memento they'll ever give them. There's Judd breaking out the smile. Not yet, not yet. There he is. There's 15 seconds. No, no he's him. not. They're getting him. No, he's got 15 seconds. Let's see if we can catch a smile, huh? Urban Johnson tacks on two more. He has 24. They chant that cry on every campus in every sport. Everyone wants to be number one. But only one can make it. And Larry Bird, a great star, congratulates the Vickers. Dick, I enjoyed work with you and Billy. Same here again. Ball. Urban Johnson leads his Michigan State team to the final score, 75-64. The first ever national basketball championship for the Spartans of Michigan State. And Brian Gumbel has the game star and his head coach, Judd Heathcote. Thank you, Dick. I am with two very, very happy, happy people here, Magic and Judd. Magic, not only were you a leader on offense, I thought you did a great job on Larry Bird in the zone denying him the ball. Yes, uh, Coach uh, gave us a good game plan to go against Larry Bird. And all we had to do was go out and do it. And if we did it, he said we would win. 
That's what we've done. Judd, I know you didn't count on Larry Bird hitting as poorly from the field as he did. Were you surprised they didn't try to force the ball into him more? Well, I think that we had a man and a half on him, Brian, and uh, it was yeah, tough to get it in. I thought maybe they could have gone to him a little more, but I think they worked the ball. Hey, this was a tough, tough game for us. Uh, they gave us all we wanted, and we're just very, very happy to win. Were either of you surprised at how close the officials were calling the ball game early on? No. Well, I sure was, but maybe he wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't, because uh, they wanted to set the tempo for the game, and they didn't want it to get out of hand. So You've seen them lose the rhythm a little bit at the 15-minute mark in the, second, in the second half when Kelser left the ball game. He sat on the bench for seven minutes, and uh, then you then you, you got outscored 14-4. to four. What happened? Well, we might have... Uh, become a little too conservative and yet without Gregory in there we have a tough time running our offense so uh, we're just glad we could hang in there and the magic man was super as usual and kept us in there let me ask two final questions the rumors say that you've played your last college game and that you're heading away from Michigan State you first I can't really say I, I haven't said that at all uh, everybody's just saying that as far as I know right now I'll be back but uh, you know everybody got the room I'm leaving but I haven't said that John how about you those are just rumors, Brian, just rumors. Right. Gentlemen, congratulations. Thank Super Bowl game. That picture. Let's go back to Dick. Okay, Brian tells it all. You feel it. You feel it with him. He's a great competitor. You know, in Terre Haute, when I first met him, I said, Larry, wouldn't you rather lose a ball game before you go into the NCAA? He says, Coach, I don't want to lose any ball games. He's such a fierce competitor. He's a winner. He's always kind of downplayed that championship game as not meaning much to him in, in, in the NCAA Finals. But I remember when he came out of the game, and he came to the bench, and he was sobbing. I mean, and he put a towel over his head, a towel over his face to cover his head completely because he just didn't want the world to know how much it meant to him. I wasn't disappointed that much in getting, uh, getting beat. It was uh, all of a sudden my career's over. And that's what hit me more than anything. Losing basketball game, you know, you'll get over that because there's always another game. But he can not replace that NCAA. And that's killing him, too. That's killing him. And he knows it, too. He look at me like, yeah, you know you got one over me that I cannot get back. Yes, Magic had his college championship. He would always be able to use to one-up on Larry Bird. And while the game is remembered as the first meeting between these two immortal figures, it's also recalled as the beginning of the explosion of college basketball's popularity. The game we've just seen drew a television rating of 24.1, and to this day that remains the highest rated college game ever. So that night, Larry and Magic catapulted the NCAA championship game into company with select events such as the Super Bowl and the World Series, events as national happenings, bigger than sports. Magic and Bird brought non-basketball fans to the Final Four. It appealed to people who, other than that night, could not have cared less about college basketball. I believe that the uh, Magic Johnson-Larry Bird confrontation in 1979 was the springboard for all the good things that have followed for college basketball. And these were the two premier players that gave the impact, the charisma, the chemistry to make college basketball what it is today. And that just created so much enthusiasm and so much passion and love for what March Madness has now become. And it all started with the mega game. The fact that the growth of college basketball uh, has been so tremendous in the ensuing 20 years, uh, and yet no game has achieved the prominence of that game, tells you everything you need to know about the extraordinary uh, uh, Olympian nature of these two personalities. So for myself and Larry, to play in that championship game and still be the number one rated NCAA final, final still, 20 years later, is saying a whole lot. March 26, 1979. That was the date that marked the beginning of this classic rivalry of the two stars that would do for the National Basketball Association what it did for the college game. When we return to the story of the game, the Larry and Magic Show had moves from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles and Boston. The rumors say that you've played your last college game and that you're heading away from Michigan State. You first. I can't really say, I, I haven't said that at all. Uh, everybody's just saying that. As far as I know right now, I'll be back. But, uh, you know, everybody got the room I'm leaving, but I haven't said that. Magic, of course, decided to leave Michigan State and enter the NBA. And that decision set the table for the personal 
and the team rivalry that would define professional basketball through the 1980s. The NBA of the late 70s bore little resemblance to the global industry it's now become. Back then, the NBA attendance was down. The league had image problems, and television viewed the NBA not as a prized property, but just another event. In fact, the NBA finals were not always televised live. All of that was about to change, and to trace the evolution, we have to enter the front offices of the Celtics and the Lakers. All the way back to the summer after Irvin Johnson's junior year in high school, the summer of 76. Los Angeles guard Gail Goodrich signed a free agent contract with the New Orleans Jazz. and his compensation, the Lakers received two future first-round draft picks, and one of those picks came in 1979. But first, the Lakers had to win a coin toss with the Chicago Bulls, and then that put them into the position to draft Magic Johnson. Larry Bird's path to the Boston Garden was much more convoluted. Follow me here now. During the 77-78 season, the Celtics had worked to trade with the Lakers, L.A. ending up with Charlie Scott, Boston getting Kermit Washington, Don Chaney, and importantly, a first-round draft pick. So, the Celtics in the spring of 78 had an extra first-round pick. Red Auerbach, the Celtics president, having the security of that extra pick, decided to gamble with it. And with the sixth selection in the NBA draft, the Celtics took Larry Bird, who had just finished his junior season at Indiana State. Now, remember, he had enrolled in Indiana and had never played there, but under the rules at that time, he was eligible to be drafted, even though he could play for another year with the Sycamores, which he did, of course, turning down the Celtics, taking Indiana State to the championship game. But now the pressure was on the Celtics. They had to sign Bird before the 79 draft, or they would lose his draft rights. Bird had all the leverage in the world, and he and Agent Bob Wolf parlayed all this into the largest rookie contract in NBA history. That was April of 79, and the investment began to pay immediate dividends as the struggling NBA entered the new decade of the 1980s. But I want you to know that this man has a smile that lights up a television screen from here to Bangor, Maine. His name is Magic Johnson, and Magic, it's a delight to have you aboard in the NBA. I think the best thing that happened for the league is that Bird wound up in Boston and Magic went out to Los Angeles. Think about those two cities now, and think about these two characters winding up there. They came in at an extraordinary time, and literally going to the Celtics and the Lakers was very fortuitous for us. Magic had the personality to capitalize on Los Angeles. He was the centerpiece of what would become known as Showtime with his style of play, his smile, and his personality. Larry went to Boston where it's traditional, purest approach to the game. Yes, Larry had a flash to his game, but it was, his game also had elements that the, the tradition-bound hard markers in Boston could appreciate. He, he played in a, in a hard hat kind of fashion. It was the complete package. It's what you would order up if you were a promoter to try and sell something. I mean, everything fit into place perfectly. The rivalry was just natural. I mean, it was just uh, almost like fate that uh, Larry came out and Magic came out and the Celtics and the Lakers, the two arch rivals of the NBA. The NBA was a remarkable beneficiary of circumstance. It was a marketing dream to have these two players placed in the cities in which they wound up and it was a journalistic dream. The dream quickly became a reality for the NBA. For the first 10 years of their careers, either Magic or Bird led his team to the NBA Finals, including three memorable head-to-head -head duels in 1984, 85, and 87. For the entire decade of the 80s, the league had its greatest players on its biggest stage, and they shined under that spotlight. It certainly took the NBA to levels that I don't think uh, any of us imagined. The game was front and center, and the two biggest names at that time were Magic and Larry, and, and Magic they were. The NBA could never do enough to thank these guys, to compensate these two people. There are two great marquee players who are available for the biggest perusal at, some, at the end of the year for, for those uh, 10 NBA seasons. I mean, we can safely say that it is some, a circumstance that will never happen again for any league at any time. We had this tremendous convergence. It doesn't happen very often in sports, you know. It's like saying that, you know, Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb played at the same time. Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams played at the same time. And Magic Johnson and Larry Bird played at the same time. It's like twins. You can't separate them. You know, they're both, uh, uh, it's like looking at two identical uh, parts. There's a photo that uh, if you ever get a chance to see it, it's these two guys under the basket and Magic and Larry are blocking out. They're two guys that will not be moved. 
And I think that was what was involved here. Their will to win was not to be denied. It became a normal, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier thing early. And then the respect grew late in the 80s when, you know, the two warriors had beaten each other up for six or seven years. They decided to, you know, there was, I think the respect began to transcend whatever differences they had. My high school coach told me one time, we, we used to play and practice, and, and I know he's using it now, I know he's using it as a motivational tool, but he said, no matter how far you run or how fast you run or how many shots you take, there's always somebody down the road a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, a little bit better. So we always thought that if we put that extra 100 jump shots in or ran that extra mile, we could stay up with that guy. And it took me a long time to think that, well, you know, that one guy he was talking about could have been Magic Johnson. Larry Bird and I will always be able to play against each other, be in competition with each other. Because right now, when we're 100, we're going to be playing checkers and no teeth, we're gumming it. You know, we're going to be still going at each other. Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, they will be linked forever, not just for their mutual qualities that made them champions, not just for their rings or the memories of Laker and Celtic dynasties. Magic and Larry will forever be linked in the marvel of their rivalry that raised their game to a level that many thought unattainable. And it all began March 26, 1979, in Salt Lake City. I'm Bob Lee. We hope you've enjoyed the story of the game. ESPN Classic will continue 